All right, sorry about that. Um, after that technical difficulty, we are now happy again to have Sanyo tell us about reasons. No worries. Uh, okay, you can see my screen and everything, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, great. Go ahead. Good. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and yeah, thank you for inviting me to give a talk. I would have loved to be there in person, but uh, can't because of visa issues. And yeah, apparently getting a visa in a pandemic is much worse than getting a visa in normal times. But anyway, I'm still very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Sanya. I'm currently a postdoc at McGill. But what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the work that I did when I was a PhD student, which was like 500 years ago in 2021. Um, it went, I was like, yeah, I, I was back in Aachen when I did this. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking about freezing in of dark matter particles and basically some technical subtle caveats that we have to keep in mind when we do these kinds of calculations and how this affects like our predictions for the dark matter abundance. Yeah, and this was work that was done with Torsten and Felix uh, and Christian, and you can find it, uh, it's uh, on the paper reference that's, that you can see on the screen. Right, so um, yeah, okay, there you go. So I don't think I have to tell uh, anyone in this room that we don't really know what 80% of the universe is made of. I'm pretty sure everyone already knows about this. So when we look at the night sky, we, we see that things are not what they should be like. So we have all of these different kinds of measurements that tell us that basically there's a hidden invisible component of mass uh, in the universe, which we don't really know about. So we have this measurement from galaxy rotation curves that tells us that most of the mass of the galaxies is invisible. We have the CMB, the anisotropies of which we can only explain if we have a significant fraction of uh, the mass density in terms in the form of a dark component. We have the bullet cluster, which tells us that, uh, which is kind of like a smoking gun signature of dark matter. We also have studies of the large scale structure of the universe that tells us that we need some sort of dark component to act as seeds to create the structure in the universe that we see today. So all of these things tell us that there is dark matter in the universe but we don't really know what it is. We don't know its particle properties, even the fact whether it, it's a particle or not. But one thing uh, that we do know about and that we are very sure about is we know exactly how much of dark matter there is. And this is really significant because uh, we know very little, few things about dark matter, but one thing that we can say with certainty from the measurements from the CMB is that we can, we can talk about the exact amount of it that there is. And we package this usually in terms of uh, this, this magical number of 0.12, which is the dark matter abundance, which we obtain from the CMB. So whenever we start thinking about dark matter from a research perspective, then it's a very good place to start. A very good place to start is to just figure out how any of our models of dark matter can reproduce this number. So this is the one thing that we know. So when we come up with a model, we say, okay, but how do we get to this magical number of 0.12? So that's a good place to start. So how do we make dark matter in the first place? Now, we know very well what happens on the standard model side of things. So we know that the standard model particles have certain interactions which are efficient enough that in the very early universe, all of the particles were kind of just part of a big hot particle soup. And all of the particles were talking to each other, interacting with, with each other and forming this, this soup in the early universe. So that we know about this. And we also know that how certain particles in the standard model itself obtain their, abund their abundances in the present day. So for example, for neutrinos, we know that they were also part of the soup at very early times. And then at some point, they, they stopped uh, their interactions with the standard model become, became inefficient compared to the expansion of the universe. And they kind of decoupled from that plasma and they obtained the relic uh, density that they have. So we know that this happened in the standard model. We've studied this. Um, we're pretty, pretty sure about how things go. So when we start thinking about dark matter, a very good place to start is then to just say, well, dark matter is also a particle, maybe, it also is part of this particle soup. And that's kind of the usual story. So the usual story is that the dark matter particle has a coupling that is large enough such that it causes the dark sector to equilibrate with the visible sector in the very early universe. And this is kind of encapsulated in the weakly interacting massive par particle paradigm or the WIMP paradigm. And it's called weakly interacting because kind of the couplings that would lead to this equilibrium in the early universe are generically weak scale couplings. So, okay, so dark matter is part of this particle soup. Uh, how does it obtain the abundance that we see? And then the answer to that, that question is just uh, the simple kind of similar to the standard model story. So you have annihilations of dark matter particles into the visible sector. And these annihilations kind of reduce the dark matter number density 
until these annihilations become inefficient because the universe is expanding and cooling. And at some point, these annihilations lose out to that expansion and the dark matter abundance freezes out. And this is what's plotted on, on the right side of the screen. So you have the number density as a function of time. So you start off with some equilibrium distribution, you reduce the abundance, you freeze out at a certain temperature, you obtain the relic abundance. And the stronger the coupling is between the two sectors, the longer you can follow down the Boltzmann curve and the fewer dark matter particles you have in the present day. And the reason that this is kind of nice and interesting um, is because by introducing kind of generic weak scale parameters for our dark matter, dark matter theory, we can reproduce the dark matter relic abundance. And this makes us feel all nice in our physics experience because it's like, we're not introducing anything that's too out of the world. We're not introducing too many parameters. It's just, everything just seems to work out and it's great and we love it. And it's, it's one of the reasons that we've been like focusing on looking for these particles through various experiments for the last several years. And that also forms an important part of the story because even though most of our search strategies have been kind of primed to look for these particles, we still haven't found them. So, uh, the, uh, so the plot that you see right now on the screen is the standard exclusion plot that you get from direct detection experiments for, so, so they, these basically test the interaction of uh, dark matter with, with some standard model target. And then the idea is that we have dug in quite a bit into the coupling space. So the exclusion bounds are digging in quite, quite, uh, quite a lot. And the WIM parameter space is kind of shrinking. And of course, it doesn't mean that WIMs are excluded. It, particularly, there are some WIM models which will, which will generically give you um, a particle that you won't expect to see in direct detection experiments. But like, even if you look at the WIM window from an indirect detection perspective, so if you look at, uh, for example, dark matter particles, and highlighting into star model particles somewhere in the galaxy. Um, if you look at that, then also kind of the width window is uh, is shrinking a bit from from various directions. So then the idea is, of course, we don't know um, wimps are not dead, of course. But then the idea is that because the wind parameter space is kind of shrinking, and we're getting these better and better experiments that that are pushing into this parameter space, it has become prudent, if it's not inevitable, to kind of start rethinking whether dark matter could be something else. And so it's come to a point where maybe we should start thinking about whether the assumptions that we have made in the WIMP paradigm are actually um, solid assumptions or whether we can play, play around with them a bit to figure out different kind of production mechanisms. And this is where freeze-in comes in. So the founding, uh, the, the kind of founding assumption of uh, the WIMP paradigm is that the dark and the visible sectors are in thermal equilibrium with each other. That's, that's the main thing. That's where we start off with. But um, this doesn't have to be true. In particular, there's no like implicit inherent reason for this to be true. Dark matter could just be its own thing and like not never and never be in equilibrium with the standard model. And this is kind of where Friesen starts. So that's the, our assumption one that the, the, the two sectors are decoupled completely in the early universe. And for this to happen, um, we, so, so requiring this assumption basically already tells us a little bit about the particle properties of of dark matter itself. So for instance, um, it would tell it, it tells us that the coupling between the dark and the visible sectors is small enough such that this equilibrium never happens. And you can get a feeling of how big this of, or of how small this coupling should be just by doing like a back of the envelope calculation. So you can write down the interaction rate, which basically tells you the cross section of a of a dark matter particle scattering off of a standard model particle um, times the number density should be always sub Hubble. So it should always be less than the expansion rate of the universe at any given temperature. So we, we can anchor this at the electroweak, uh, the temperature of the electroweak phase transition. And if you just run the numbers down, you can basically say that the coupling has to be off the order 10 to the minus seven or less. Um, and then this is of course very, very, uh, very vanilla. So this number can change depending on the exact model you have. But then the idea is compared to the weak couplings, which are order one, this coupling is extremely, extremely tiny. And, and, and that's one thing. So for, uh, for freeze-in models, you always need couplings that are super, super small. Uh, and we call these feeble couplings. And because we are really good with naming things and we are very creative, um, we have called these models as feebly interacting massive particle models or FIMP models. So the idea of FIMP models then, the two, two conditions for FIMPs, uh, for FIMPs is that uh, the dark matter is never in equilibrium. So that leads to these very small couplings. And on top of that, we assumed the initial dark matter density is negligible. Now, again, this is just an assumption. We just, you can motivate it by saying that, well, the two sectors are completely decoupled. So you can kind of say maybe reheating populates one sector over the other. So we just start off with a dark matter density that is 
close to zero, very, very small. But then of course, now we're in a universe where we have no dark matter essentially at the beginning. So the question is, how do we get to this magic number of 0.12 again? And the, the answer to that is basically you think about the wimps and you flip that entire thing on its head. So instead of dark matter annihilating into standard model particles, you essentially consider reactions where you produce dark matter from the standard model plasma. So you start off with a negligible dark matter abundance, and then you kind of slowly populate the dark matter density by these annihilations and decays. And at some point, these processes, because they're also comp competing with the expansion of the universe, at some point, these processes would lose out and the dark, dark matter would freeze in to, its, uh, to, to the, uh, the abundance that it has today. And then uh, the, the thing to note in this kind of scenario is now the abundance is directly proportional to the strength of the coupling between the dark and the visible sectors. So if you increase the coupling, you increase the rate of these annihilation processes or production processes, and you increase the abundance of dark matter that you have today. So, so that's kind of the general way that freezing works. And of course, because we have these very tiny couplings, we generically evade all strong constraints. Um, this doesn't mean that these models are untestable because that would just make them boring models. So you can still test for them, but then the idea is that you, uh, because of these small couplings, you, it's very easy to evade the really strong constraints that you get, for example, from direct detection experiments. So um, uh, yeah, and uh, I should have said this at the beginning, but like, uh, feel free to ask any questions and interrupt me at any time. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with like stopping and going through things again uh, if they're not clear. Uh, okay. So until now, I've been talking very qualitatively about what happens and uh, doing just order of magnitude stuff. But of course, part of my talk uh, here today is to actually dig into the weeds a bit and to tell you about how uh, solving these equations and getting to the right relic density is not as easy as um, I've made it sound like so far. And so uh, for the next part of my talk, I'm just going to talk about how to do all of this a bit more quantitatively with a bit more math. So whenever we think about particle number densities and especially evolution of particle number densities, we end up solving Boltzmann equations. And there, there's essentially simple one-dimensional differential equations. So in this case, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the rate of change of the dark matter number density um, compared to the Hubble expansion of the universe. So you can reframe this in terms of a co-moving number density, which is given by Y. So it's a scale invariant quantity, um, which you will, uh, see more and more instead of n, so we're going to do everything in terms of y. And on the right-hand side, you have the collision term, which basically tells you the rate of uh, reactions that increase the particle densities of this particle and, and the reactions that decrease the particle density. So essentially, you have um, th this collision term would depend on uh, production of these particles and annihilations of these particles. Now, for freezing, things are a bit simpler because, as we've already talked about, the initial density of dark matter is negligible or close to zero. And the couplings are very small, so you can basically ignore the second part of the collision term. So you can ignore all the back reactions, um, and you just have this one, one term on the right, which means that you can reduce the Boltzmann equation down to a simple one-dimensional equation uh, that depends on the production cross-section and the uh, equilibrium densities of the standard model particles that actually produce uh, your dark matter. And this looks like a very nice and simple and easy equation to solve. But if you've had any, um, if you if if you've if you've solved a Boltzmann equation before, you know that they're not they're not actually quite that easy to solve. And instead, like solving a Boltzmann equation is op opening a can of worms. These are like stiff equations. You need to have we have like a lot of dedicated codes on the market that solve these equations accurately and numerically and in a way that is actually fast and doesn't take like hours and hours to do it. Um, but that's on the numerical side of things, which is they're they're difficult to solve numerically. But what I'm going to talk about today is that actually even just physically thinking about these Boltzmann equations is opening a whole different kind of forms, especially in the case of Friesen. And the reason for that becomes clear if you look at this plot again that I showed before, which is the, the dark matter number density as a function of time. So we see that the dark matter density evolves over a range of temperatures. So in the case of freeze out, we just had an equilibrium distribution that at some point chemically decouples and it kind of just freeze out. So you're sensitive to only a small range of temperatures around the point where this chemical decoupling happens. But for freeze in, we're kind of like slowly populating the dark sector. And so we're sensitive to a wider range of temperatures, which means that we're sensitive to whatever's happening in the standard model plasma in those range of temperatures. And what I'm going to talk about and and what I'm going to try to convince you about is that these effects are actually quite relevant when you're solving these Boltzmann equation. And in particular, I'll be talking about three different effects. So 
I'm going to be talking about in medium effects, which is just my way of saying that whenever you're in, uh, the, in the plasma of the early universe, you essentially, you single out the cosmic rest frame instead of, you're not in vacuum, you're in a plasma. And this uh, means that you're basically dependent on the phase space distributions of the particles in that rest frame. So essentially what this means is that if you consider quantum gases, you can you can you have to approximate their phase space distributions properly in that rest frame, and that results in a frame dependence in the, in the solving of the Boltzmann equation. Then I'm going to be talking about thermal effects, which just basically means that particle widths and particle masses in in medium um, get modified. And uh, this is quite a well-known result from stellar physics. So we know that photons in medium, for instance, behave as massive particles. We know that uh, photons can actually decay into neutrinos and change like stellar cooling rates. And this is a well-studied result. And it makes sense to kind of think about the early universe as also a relativistic plasma. And so it kind of makes sense to think about how particle properties within that plasma would get modified in the early universe. Essentially, we're moving from vacuum QFT to something like finite temperature QFT in the early universe. And of course, we also have phase transitions, which we know from the stand model side of things. And these kind of uh, have an effect on the relevant degrees of freedom that are present, which affects, for example, the Hubble expansion. And hence, it would affect the, the, the point where this reason would, would happen. So this, this would also change uh, kind of the, the answer that you would get from solving the Boltzmann equation. So now that we know that solving a Boltzmann equation is not as easy as it would appear, um, the rest of my talk would be divided into kind of like two broad, broad strokes portions. So the first one would be, I'm going to talk about a reformulation of the Boltzmann equation. We're going to move away from the standard FIMP equation that you see in the literature to a, to a reformulation that would consistently account for in medium and thermal effects. So I'm going to make frame, the Boltzmann equation essentially um, something that includes the frame dependence that is inherent because we're in a plasma in the early universe and not in vacuum. And once I've done that reformulation, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to apply this to a simple model. And we're going to see what these, how big these effects actually are and whether they're relevant and why you should or should not worry about them. So, um, okay. So the first part is the reformulation. And I'm going to start with the generic collision term for Friesen, which if you remember, this basically just tells you in the case of Friesen, it's just the production rate of, of your particles. And so this looks like a big equation, but it's, it's pretty easy to understand. So you, at the beginning, you have the symmetry factor, which basically tells you whether the sun model particles that are producing dark matter are identical or non-identical. You have the standard Lorentz invariant phase space uh, integrals over all particles. Then you have a delta function, which basically specifies energy and momentum conservation. And then you have the matrix element for production. In this case, psi represents some standard model initial state. And then you have the phase space distributions of those particles in, in, in the plasma of the early universe. So now what we're going to do is we're going to reframe this in terms of the dark matter and hylation cross-section. And at first sight, this might, this might seem like we're introducing an unnecessary level of complication in the physical understanding of the equation. But my point here is to convince you that actually this reframing makes it much easier to solve that equation numerically and to actually include all of these frame dependent effects into the equation itself. So we're going to reframe it in terms of the dark matter and hylation cross-section simply by using the following things. So we're going to change the matrix element from production to that of inhalation, which is just an equality because of CP invariance. And we're going to modify the phase space distribution of the standard model states into the phase space distribution of some fiducial dark matter density, which, is, which has no real um, meaning. It's just a mathematical construct in that sense. So we're just going to use energy conservation to multiply with some exponentials and we're going to simplify this equation to something that depends on a fiducial Maxwell-Boltzmann dark matter density. Once again, not, not the physical density because the, for Friesen, the dark matter phase space is not Maxwell-Boltzmann at all, but it's just a mathematical trick that we employ uh, to, to make our lives slightly easier. So what happens now is you have this collision term, which kind of looks like this, slightly more complicated. And in particular, you have these terms uh, multiplied with the matrix elements is one minus epsilon psi f psi. And these are actually the things that encode the frame dependence in our equation. Because now um, the phase space distribution of the standard model particles, they only take the usual form, uh, which is this, so one over exponential of whatever plus epsilon. So this form is only there in the cosmic rest frame. And uh, whenever we evaluate cross sections in particular, we always do this in the center of mass frame. And so the, so, uh, so the frame dependence inherently enters because of these phase space factors that I've put in, in this way. And of course, you have the Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, which are not the true distributions. 
so, so this slightly ugly looking equation can actually be simply uh, can be reduced to a semi analytic form. And this is uh, what you can find in our paper. It was built upon the works of other people uh, uh, that did somewhat similar things before. So in particular, Oleg Lebedev uh, and others uh, did this. But then the idea is that you can reduce this to a form that's not super ugly, and it's actually super easy to, uh, to integrate then. So the idea is that you, you reduce it down to a Boltzmann equation that looks like what's on the screen right now. So you have the, um, the annihilation, the thermally average annihilation cross-section time multiplied by some fiducial dark matter density uh, squared. And the important point is that this cross-section that enters here now is the complete in-medium cross-section, and it includes the proper relativistic spin statistics factors for the particles uh, that are present in the system. So if you want to look at, uh, uh, and this has an analytic form, so, so this, uh, this is what the analytic form looks like. But the important thing to note is now that is, is that the cross-section now is not just a function of the center of mass energy, but it is a function of the center of mass energy times a boost factor. And this is the boost that actually, um, uh, th this is the boost that we apply so that the, the phase-space distributions have the, have the relevant form. Um, yes, I see a question, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I just have uh, one question. So here the Gondolo and the Giovini, they have done mm -hmm. the, they just used the, Maxwell distribution. So have you compared the error of their calculation and yours? How much will they? Make? Yeah, so uh, yeah. So um right. So this formula actually reduces down to the gondolo Gelmini one if you uh, if you take the limit uh, the epsilon psi zero. So basically if you assume that particles can be Maxwell Bo are Maxwell Boltzmann instead of like Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein. So this this is formula is equivalent to, to the gondolo Gelmini one in that limit. Um as far as how how different these are, I'm going to show you, um, not, in, not at the level, well, yeah, I do actually have a slide at the level of cross-section itself, um, and but I'm going to show, show that when I start talking about like models in, in specifically. So yeah, so, yeah. yeah so, so this form is kind of generic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I have another question is, uh, yeah, I just uh, naively assume if the number density occupational number is not that high, and then it seems there's not much difference between like, Boltzmann or Boltzmann distribution or or Bose Einstein yeah. or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it turns out that actually, um, so so it, it largely depends on uh, when the production is happening. So I think uh, if it's like if the temperatures are large, these these effects are substantial. So uh, so yeah, but but it definitely depends upon um, a number of factors. So 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 how how big the difference is. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it depends on which part of the parameter space you're looking at. Thank you. Yeah, Can thank you. As well? Yes, go ahead. So here you're still assuming that the dark matter still is in equilibrium, right? No. So we're not assuming anything about the dark matter. So the only thing that we're assuming about the dark matter phase space is that it is uh, it is always smaller than the standard model phase space distribution. And it's, it's much smaller than one, basically. Uh, so, so, so the so the number density that comes here is not the actual dark matter number density, but just a mathematical construct. So it's just a fiducial um, density. So we're not assuming anything about the phase space of the dark matter particle itself. The only assumption I think is that you can neglect the inverse process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, so right, so you, so you can you can write it down in this way, and it's very nice, and it's easily integrable, and we like it. Uh, so um, yeah, but then another thing that kind of comes out for free in this kind of formulation uh, is that this um, this way of writing things down is easily generalizable to the case of an S channel resonance. And this is something that we were very confused about when we started uh, with this work, which was how do we relate a two to two process in which you have an on-shell mediator with just a process where this mediator is in thermal equilibrium and decays. Now, usually um, what, what, is, what is true or what is physically intuitive is that these two processes are exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if two standard model particles collide, create an on-shell Higgs and the Higgs decays, or if we just assume like a thermal density of Higgs, which are decaying, like these two processes should be the same. But we weren't really sure how this works out mathematically, because if you look at the collision term for these two processes, the collision term for this two to two process would depend on the phase space distribution of the fermions on the standard model side. 
So these F psi, F psi, but the phase space, but the collision term for this decay would just depend on the phase space distribution of the mediator, which in this case would be a boson. And this would be, uh, this would be weird. So what we were confused about was how do the spin statistics of the bosons enter into the, into the two to two cross section of, uh, it, it, yeah, exactly. So how, how, do, how do they enter into the two to two uh, cross section itself? And then the answer, if you think about it, actually um, is, is quite intuitive and, and simple. It's just that you have to modify the way you write down the propagator in that two to two process. So it, in particular, you have to use a modified in medium width of the propagator uh, for the mediator in this two to two process. And the, uh, the reason for that is that whenever, because these processes are happening in medium, the decay width of the mediator is not what it is, what it would be in the vacuum, but, it, but it's actually um, a difference between the production rate and the decay rate of this mediator. And so numerically, this is what the decay width looks like. So it is normalized by some, something that depends on, the, uh, on, on, the, on this phase space density of this mediator itself. And then it's, it depends on the factor of G bar, which basically tells, uh, so G bar is essentially the Fermi suppression or the Bose enhancement, depending on the final state particles that you have from this decay. And then the idea is that if you look at, uh, if you just add this decay width to your two to two process, you can show that these two um, diagrams are exactly equivalent mathematically. And if you want to look at the details, you can look at a paper, but then uh, the, the key takeaway is that if you formulate everything in the way that we're proposing, you can just forget about the decays as long as the mediator is something that would uh, that would equilibrate with, with the standard model heat path. So you can forget about the decays, you can do everything at the level of two to two processes, and that would give you the right relic abundance. So, um, was there a question? Sorry. No. Okay. Uh, good. So right. So and so this was most of the mathy part uh, of my talk. Now we're hopefully going to look at some plots and uh, forget about the math for a bit. So we're gonna start thinking about now how to apply this to a model and to make uh, everything simple. We're gonna look at the simplest dark matter model there is. Um, simplest renormalizable dark matter model there is, which is that you just add a scalar singlet to the standard model protected by some Z2 symmetry, and it talks to the standard model via a renormalizable interaction with the Higgs doublet. And, and that's just it. So you just add this one interaction term to the standard model. So um, until now, so, so we've, uh, I've spoken about in medium effects and I've spoken a bit about thermal effects, but I've stayed away so far from, from the phase transitions and, and their effects. And the reason for that is because I wanted to introduce the model first and then uh, basically relate to what happens um, uh, with the phase transitions. So I'm going to do that now. So we're going to start with just a very quick discussion about what happens um, at very early times. So we're going to start with the electroweak phase transition that we all know and love. So we know that the Higgs uh, potential is a function of temperature and at very early times it was completely symmetric and uh, the particles did not have any uh, masses that depended on the web, for instance. And then at some point, uh, this potential develops a Mexican hat shape, which breaks the electroweak symmetry, and it gives all of the particles the masses that they have. So because of, because of the fact that uh, the Higgs potential is a function of temperature, this tells us that the Higgs mass and the Higgs web are also functions of temperature. So these are two quantities that we're, we're, we're used to thinking about as some, something that have a fixed value. So, uh, but then in fact, they, in, at very early times, they don't, actually don't have a fixed value, but change with, with the temperature. And this is what's shown in the plots below. So the first plot is the, the evolution of the Higgs web as a function of temperature. So at very large temperatures, the web is zero because the potential is symmetric. At some point, the electroweak symmetry breaks, and then the web kind of slowly relaxes down to its value of 246 GeV. So there's a, uh, it, it, so it doesn't, it doesn't. So the point is that it doesn't exactly jump from zero to 246, but it follows like a, a slope to, to to its value today. And the same you can do with the Higgs mass. So before, um, at very large temperatures, before electroweak symmetry breaking, the Higgs would have a mass that would completely be given by thermal effects. And this is similar to what I spoke about, like photons in medium. So essentially, this is a mass because the Higgs particle is interacting with particles in the standard model plasma, it develops a thermal mass, uh, which is proportional to the temperature. And at small masses, after, after small temperatures, after electroweak symmetry breaking happens, the Higgs mass kind of relaxes down to its value of 125 GeV. So whenever we're thinking about production of uh, dark matter with particles that interact with the Higgs, we have to make sure that we keep in mind that the Higgs mass and the Higgs web are not uh, fixed parameters, but actually vary with temperature. Uh, on top of that, 
because of electroweak symmetry breaking, the coupling structure of the Lagrangian itself would change and through the phase transition. And by that, I simply mean that the processes that are relevant for production of dark matter would be different before and after the phase transition. So in particular, for the model that I showed, which was a simple scalar singlet model, before the electroweak phase transition, we just have this quartic vertex, which, so the only way that you can produce um, the scalars is by, the, uh, by this quartic vertex and that's it. But then after the phase transition, because you have this breaking of the electroweak symmetry, the scalar can now talk to the fermions and other particles on the stand model side of things through, through a Higgs. And essentially uh, you, you would produce these scalars by two to two processes that would look like what's on the right side of the screen. Now this in particular, this is important because uh, we've been, uh, I've, been, I've been talking about like framing um, Friesen in terms of dark matter annihilation. And this is particularly neat in the case of this model because if you write the process, uh, this two to two process in terms of scalar annihilation, you can quantify it. You can always quantify it in terms of the off-shell Higgs decay wave. And the reason that this is interesting because, is because Higgs physics is quite well known. And so this off-shell Higgs decay wave, we've already calculated um, high order corrections to this. So essentially, if you write on a cross section in, in this form, you are actually, it's very easy to include all higher order effects on the standard model side of things. So on the dark matter side, it's still leading order. So we're not calculating any loops, but because the Higgs, the Higgs decay width is known to higher orders, you can include them quite, uh, quite easily just by modification of this decay width that enters into the cross section. And um, this is, is nice, but it's also, uh, it leads to a certain uh, problem, which is that at very large center of mass energies, the NLO corrections to this width seem, which is predicted by numerical tools, which you can get, um, they seem to diverge. And this is not a physical divergence. This just tells us that even high order effects are necessary to be included to kind of regulate, regulate this width. And so I'm gonna show you what this divergence looks, looks like. So on the plot right now is just the annihilation cross section plotted as a function of the center of mass energy. And the two lines, the blue line is just the scalars annihilating into any random standard model final state, well, all of them actually. And the orange line is just into HH. So if now we plot the, um, if we add the NLO corrections to the off-shell width, this is what the cross-section looks like. So we see this divergence that happens at very large square root of S, which seems to violate unitarity. Now, of course, we know that this kind of uh, violation is unphysical. So this is mostly related to the fact that um, you have these very soft gauge bosons that, that you can produce uh, in the width. And then these, uh, and, and to regulate this, you need to calculate, you need to go one level up and calculate an NLO and, and that would like fix it. But we don't wanna do that because that seems like a lot of work and, and it's hard. So what we do is instead, we, we try to unitize the cross section. So we do a trick, uh, which is that we replace the on-shell decay width in the denominator with the off-shell width. And so what this does is that at very large center of mass energies, it basically makes the cross section fall faster than one over S. And so it regulates that divergence. But of course, that's also not very nice because we know that adding higher order effects shouldn't lead to a cross section that is even smaller than the tree level cross section, so it is, which is the dashed blue line. So what we do instead is we, we use a combined form instead so that we always kind of um, regulate it over the entire range of the center of mass energies. So this is just a trick that, uh, that we employ. But then the question of course is, is this trick even necessary? And actually in fact, are these large center of mass energies even relevant? Because if you think about it, these two to two processes only occur after the phase transition has happened where the temperatures are quite small, which means that the particles having center of mass energies that are so large are not that many. And so you, you would think that maybe it's just easy to put a cut somewhere and ignore them. But then uh, the this, this this trick is just including some higher order corrections and not other higher order corrections. Yes, so it's it's that, that it doesn't blow up, isn't it? Totally arbitrary. Um, yeah, so it's it's like you can you can add um, yeah, so so it's it's including NLO corrections to the decay width. So in principle, you can you can make this even more accurate by adding an NLO. But then the, the like you said, there's these soft divergences, or maybe I could probably think of them as two to three processes that you're not including, and aren't those the same order? Yeah. Um, no, I think uh, no, I think the point is that these soft divergences are, are uh, sorry, these soft processes are what lead to the divergence, and to regulate them, you, ha you have to go one order up, so they're not the same order. Yeah, 
Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if is is there even a sense that the NLO is better than tree level at this point? Um, I guess you would say yes. Below yeah. On TV, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess the NLO uh, is slightly better uh, than tree level, uh, especially if you, if you look at, for example, at small center mass energies, you do see a difference between like the solid line and the dashed line. So, so it would give you so so divergence only happens at very large squared of s, but at small squared of s, you still get a better approximation if you use NLO over tree level. Like, should I really think of the unit, the thing you draw as unitization, as being better than the dotted, or should I just oh, think that everything? So, is so the unitization, is, yeah. So the unitization itself is 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 not better, but the combined form is better. So the combined form is it basically just picks out the most accurate uh, cross section at all center of mass energies. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the the reason that kind of these. Uh, the, the fact that these these things diverge is, is important is, is because we're once again because we're doing everything at finite temperature. So what this means is that if you consider the off shell Higgs decay width in general, it would just be proportional to the mass of the particle that is decaying to. And at finite temperature, this would just be a function of the web and some function of the ratio of the center of mass energy and the web. So what this means is that large center of mass energies is effectively the same limit as the web going to zero, which means that when you go to temperatures that are very close to the phase transition where the web is very small, this divergence would happen at earlier and earlier times, which means that uh, you have to regulate uh, these, uh, which means you have to regulate these cross sections uh, for the processes at those times. So if you look at the plot, uh, so you just have add more lines for temperatures of 140 GeV, 160 GeV. So the divergence just happens at smaller square root of S, which means that this regularization enters earlier and earlier and is actually uh, relevant. So in particular, if you have very heavy dark matter, which is dominantly produced at temperatures which are close to the phase transition, this effect is quite sizable um, and relevant. So, so, so this is kind of the, the very early, well, the electroweak uh, side of things. Uh, all of the things that we have to keep in mind if you consider the electroweak phase transition and this reformulation. But we also have a second phase transition in the standard model, which is the QCD phase transition. So this basically means that at some point, which is around 150 MeV or so, the free quarks and gluons in the plasma are confined to form hadrons. And this changes the degrees of freedom that are available, so it changes the particles that the scalar can annihilate into or be produced from. And to keeping in mind the formulation that we're thinking about, so we're basically writing down all annihilation cross sections in terms of the off-shell Higgs decay width. We can we can see how the off-shell decay width Higgs decay width changes with um, uh, as a function once again of the center of mass energy. So for temperatures smaller than the QCD phase transition, you have uh, decays into pions and kaons and mesons instead of quarks, and so your total decay width uh, changes before and after the phase transition. And uh, you might think that uh, this difference, so the differences between the dashed uh, gray line and the dotted gray line, I guess. So you might seem to think that this difference appears to be quite small in particular, like would this even affect the, uh, the, the cross sections in any way because it doesn't look like a large difference. But then the idea is that it actually does affect the cross sections uh, in a sizable way. So if you look at the annihilation, the total annihilation cross section uh, as a function of inverse temperature, for different dark matter masses, we see that if we ignore the QCD phase transition, so we always consider decays in quarks and gluons, uh, we overestimate our cross sections quite significantly. So in this plot, it's it's the dot dash lines um, that that have this idea that we just have free quarks and gluons at all at all times, and then the solid lines are what actually happens. And this uh, this changes the cross section by orders of magnitude. So depending on whether uh, if you're sensitive to this range of temperatures during production, you can actually uh, change your dark matter abundance quite sizably. So you can change that prediction. And so uh, you can mess up your relic density calculations uh, by a lot. So I've, I've spoken a lot um, already, uh, but to, to quickly kind of step back and just see, uh, get a bird's eye 
but I view of what I've said until now. So I've said that uh, Friesen, you can write it down in terms of dark matter annihilation cross-section, and this generically includes in medium and thermal effects. Uh, I've shown how in the case of a scalar singlet model, this, this additionally helps us to include NLO corrections to, to our cross-sections. And I've uh, also told you about how the QCD phase transition, for instance, um, changes the cross-sections quite sizably, and we have to consistently account uh, for this by looking at uh, by adding the right the relevant degrees of freedom the right relevant degrees of freedom so so these are three things that I've spoken about until now and now we're going to finally look at how big these changes actually are when you look at something like a coupling versus mass plot for the relic abundance for instance so once again we're going to do this in two two parts so the first part would just be what I'm calling IR freezing and what what this means essentially is I'm just assuming that the reheating temperature is very very large it's not a relevant scale in the problem, nothing much happens at those times, and we're only sensitive to lower temperatures, and I'm calling this IR freezing. So we're going to first look at uh, the cross sections. So just to remind everyone, uh, we're interested in solving this Boltzmann equation, which is shown on the top of the screen, and we're looking at the cross sections of the scalars and highlighting into stand model particles. And so to start with, we're just going to look at the cross section in a completely vanilla uh, treatment. So we're going to forget about all of these effects that I've flapped about for the last uh, several minutes. Um, and we're just going to do like a, like a standard thermal average cross-section as a function of inverse temperature. And this is what this looks like for a dark matter particle of around of a mass of 10 GeV and some, some value of the coupling, which is not relevant. Um, then the idea is that you see this bump that happens around the Higgs mass. And this is because around these temperatures, the, the Higgs decays become efficient. So this is the Higgs resonance that you see. So this is the general treatment, um, which uh, which would happen if you ignore all of the effects that I've talked about. So now we're going to include, uh, one by one, we're going to turn on uh, the effects and see how that changes things. So first we're going to turn on thermal effects. So what this first does is that because now we have this, uh, we are considering the phase transition. So before the electroweak phase transition, you don't really have Higgs decays, right? So this would push down your cross-section by a bit, and, and then you will just have the Higgs decays in the, uh, at, at, uh, after the phase transition at smaller temperatures. And then so the curve would look kind of the same over there. Then we're going to turn on quantum statistics. So this does something weird. So it pushes up your cross section at large temperatures. And this is just because you, uh, in, this, in this regime, the main production channel is just this quartic vertex with bosons in both the initial and final state. And so you have an, a Bose enhancement in your cross section. So that pushes it up. Uh, at smaller temperatures, you instead have fermions because the main production channel is, is, is via two fermions going to a Higgs to something else and also the Higgs decays. So, so, so these two effects will kind of compete with each other. And so you will you, you find that there's a difference. So when the Higgs decays are not super relevant, you have a suppression in the co cross section because of this Fermi suppression, but then these two effects compete and you kind of like land on the same vanilla uh, case as before. So, 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 these are, these, uh, so these are what the effects look like for a particle that has a mass of 10 GV, but then you can also do it for a particle that has a mass that is slightly higher, so 300 GV, where, in which case you don't have the Higgs resonance, but you do have these temperature effects, which, which kind of move your cross section up or down, depending on what effect exactly you're looking at. So uh, now if you want to actually look at the yield uh, or how the yield changes, so this is what that would look like. So this is essentially just the right hand side of the equation. Um, as a function of inverse temperature. And it's essentially the same as the cross section, but now it's just multiplied by this Boltzmann, fiducial Boltzmann distribution for the particles. And so you have just some cutoff at, at, at very small temperatures. So you have a Boltzmann suppression there. Uh, so the idea is that now we've seen kind of how these effects come in uh, come into play. So we can make some uh, assumptions, we, we can we can make some predictions of what we will we, we'll see finally. So what we're interested in is essentially the inter the this integral the integral of this equation to figure out the relic abundance and we have to compare this relic abundance to this magic number of 0.12 so we know that for dark for scalars that are lighter than half the higgs mass the most of the production would happen around the higgs resonance which means that, that this would be like slightly smaller temperatures so maybe the temperature effects would be quite small and we've also seen the medium effects uh, basically compete because you have fermions in the initial state and then a boson that is mediating. So you will have slightly, so these two effects would kind of cancel each other out. So we overall, we're, we're looking at somewhat smallish effects. For larger uh, scalar masses, we know that uh, we're, we're producing them at, at larger temperatures. So, so, so those effects are sizable 
and also we'll be mostly producing them with like bosons and uh, after the phase transition we're producing them with like bosons in initial state and that would also change uh, uh ch change the prediction depending on which effects you take into account and not so if now we look at like the parameter scan so we look at the couplings that give us the right relic abundance as a function of the mass over a range of dark matter masses. So this is from kV to like 10 TV or so. Um, th this is what the plot looks like. So on the very left corner, there's a there's a red uh, exclusion bound, which, which is just simple warm dark matter bound for PIMS. So essentially this comes from the fact that if you produce these dark, ma dark matter particles, uh, they're very relativistic and they erase structure. And so you can essentially Put a lower limit on the mass this is similar to the WIMP bound. Um, it's, I think it's slightly stronger than the WIMP, uh, than the warm dark matter bound essentially for the WIMPs. Um, for we see that up to the Higgs resonance, like we like we thought, the the effects are kind of around five percent or ten percent maybe. So so this is shown in, in the bottom panel. So this is the relative difference um, in in the coupling that you obtain. So it, it the the effect kind of hovers around five to ten percent. But then for large dark matter masses this effect is quite substantial. So in particular, we see that um, we have this, uh, this effect can be as large as 30% uh, for certain range of dark matter masses. So the idea is that these effects are quite sizable. And of course, because we have spoken about how these effects can also compete with each other, it's, it, it actually more, mostly depends on what kind of model you're looking at. So it might be that, that you, that, that your, in your model, all of the effects cancel out and you end up with a vanilla, vanilla thing and everything's fine, but all of these effects can also add up and, and give you a substantially different prediction for the relic abundance. So this was uh, for the IR case. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about the, well, this should be two, but okay. So we're gonna talk about UV freezing. And uh, what I mean by UV freezing is essentially- I'm going to ask a question first. Yes, go. Cool. You were just talking about the total dark matter yield. Yes. Like the phase space distribution could also be interesting. Um, uh, like the, the, you're freezing into something that's not equilibrium distribution, but some other distribution. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you th think about that at all? I was just wondering if any of these effects would affect the phase space. Um, so you're, you're just asking the question, what's the total energy density? And then yeah. you, have, you have this, but, but you could ask what, what people have looked at the freeze in. Yeah, so, yes, so, so uh, are you, okay. So I'm not sure if I understand uh, what you're asking. So, so the phase space would affect then the bounds that you get from, for example, from structure formation. For example, yeah, I'm just curious if any of these effects like might have, might have bigger fractional effects on the phase space distribution than on the total number. Um, I just wonder if the shape of the phase space distribution depend, depends on the defining temperature effects or. Uh, or that is interesting. I think form bounds are, or, or like you said, or, but, but I'm just, just wondering. Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. I think. Uh, Yeah, I don't, I don't know the state of the art for people yeah. that look at the phase space. Mm -hmm. So what I understand, so what I uh, what I recall off the top of my head is that the dark matter phase space it, it basically kind of inherits that phase space in some sense from uh, the phase space of the particles that is producing it. So um, so definitely, for example, I know that in the case of plasmons, um, for example, if dark matter is produced dominantly by like plasmon decays in the early universe, you can have a very peaked phase space distribution and that's just because it inherits like the plasmon distribution in some sense yeah good so that'd be yeah. an example where finite temperature effect is actually affecting yeah. phase space very yeah. exactly mm -hmm. yeah so it can have the, the uh, that effect and in particular like i think uh depending on then whether because right now i haven't really mentioned like the self-coupling of the scalar but if you have that then you can essentially even further modify the dark matter phase space distribution after you've already had like uh, after you're frozen in dark matter, and that can affect like the bounds that you would get from structure formation, for instance. Yeah, I have, I have a question following George's question. Yeah. Um, so, so here uh, I'm just wondering your formula is for the integrable Boltzmann equation, or it can be done for the phase space because I just seem it's like just the yeah. equation. I'm sorry, uh, can you say that again? I, I mean, is your formula for the integral Boltzmann integral integrable Boltzmann equation or none, or it can be the full Boltzmann equation? Uh, no, so so it's, so our form is for the integrated Boltzmann, so it's at the level of the number density and not the phase space. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, then I can get to you refreeze it, uh, which basically just means that now I'm, I'm 
going to start considering the reheating temperature as a relevant scale in the problem. In particular, I'm going to consider low values of reheating temperatures and see how that affects uh, the, the predictions for the number densities of dark matter, or energy density of dark matter. So the background for this is essentially that um, we're used to thinking about reheating temperature as some certain large temperature in the universe, but the fact is that we don't really have um, any idea what this temperature could be. The only thing that we know is that BBN has happened, which means that the reheating temperature should be at least 5 MeV or so for, for those things to work out um, as, as we expect them to. So we have a lower bound in the reheating temperature of, of 5 MeV, and there is no reason for it to be much larger than 5 MeV uh, given the current status of observations. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to think about reheating temperatures that are smaller than the Higgs mass, which means that the interaction um, between the scalars and the standard model would be described by a dimension five operator. Uh, so you'd have, for example, direct interactions of scalars with fermions uh, by, given by some dimension five operator. Now, the reason that this is interesting is that now the cross sections um, for production of these scalars would be independent of temperature. So it's only dependent on this one over lambda, but then the production rate, which is a function of the cross section times the number density is proportional to the temperature to the cubed which means that the production would be dominated by the largest allowed temperatures. And in particular, it would be dominated by the value of the reheating temperature that we choose. The second thing is that because we have these very small reheating temperatures, um, we, can, we can have significantly larger couplings and still satisfy the condition of in equilibrium. And this is because the interaction rate is always suppressed by one over the, the Higgs mass to the fourth power because of this dimension five operator. So, so you can essentially have freeze in, but still, um, have very large couplings. So you can have you can have like weak scale couplings and still have freezing if you limit yourself to this regime. And of course now, because we're talking about reheating temperatures of, of MeV scales, we know that the QCD phase transition is going to be relevant um, because the production would happen around those scales as well. So now I'm going to show you a plot of the abundance of dark matter as a function of uh, the dark matter mass for different values of the reheating temperature. So this is what this plot looks like. So the different colored lines are different values of the reheating temperature. And just to, just to make clear how important the QCD phase transition is in this specific case, I've also plotted uh, the abundance for um, of dark matter if we consider uh, no confinement. So this is the dot dashed purple line. And we see that we overestimate the abundance by like several orders of magnitude if we, if, if we consider like quarks and gluons instead of hadrons. And the other thing to notice in this plot is that, the, so, so this plot is plotted for a specific value of coupling, which in this case is 10 to the minus five. And we see that we, oh, we are kind of very, we have very small abundances for like small reading temperatures. So to push up the abundances, we would have to increase the couplings, which means that we would have very kind of largish couplings uh, that would give us the right like abundance, which is pretty cool because the one thing about reason we know is that Friesen has very small couplings, but that doesn't have to be true. It depends on the, the underlying assumptions of the cosmology that you uh, that you take. So now, if you do like the same parameter scan as before, if you plot uh, the portal coupling, uh, how, are defining, how are you defining T reheat? Um, how how are we defining it? Yeah, is it like that? You're just starting the Boltzmann equation at that temperature yeah, yeah. and running it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just that. So we so we just yeah. So it's from T reheat to zero. If you, people. People who, who study like models of reheating, I'm not one of them, but they might complain like that, that that you really would need to model the decay of something or, or like because here your game is to do things precisely. So this this <laughs> pretty crude like a uh, way of talking about reheating. Uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. Um, I, I think for this this part of the project, we were interested in was seeing just how how much this would. So so in particular, what we were interested in was seeing how much. Uh, including this this QCD phase transition would uh, would matter like on a qualitative level in the first place. And it, so this is something that uh, yeah, probably I've glossed over it a bit. So we we don't we also don't actually model the QCD phase transition like exactly because that is very hard. Um, so we do we do a bit of like hand wavy estimations in that part as well. But I think uh, the 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 idea in this in this particular section was to was to actually make the case that you can have freeze in with large couplings if you just play around with something else instead. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about this diagram. So here, yeah, it seems very impressive that there's you know a large deviation for the non-confinement case uh, mm -hmm. for the non case and uh, 
Uh, I mean, yeah. So, so I'm just wondering. So, what's the main factor cost, uh, which caused this deviation? Because I just naively think, oh, Q, after QCD visit transition, the degree of freedom is reduced. Uh, this, yeah. yeah. And the second, there's also the resonance. So, which one is the dominant? Um, yeah, I think I think the most dominant one is the fact that uh, some decay channels get closed okay. because of uh, some mesons are more massive, and so if you have dark matter that is kind of light, it can no longer decay into that. Uh, or annihilate into that essentially. So, so the cross sections get uh, pushed down. So, so this was a plot that I showed way, way in the beginning. So the cross section essentially uh, decreases because there are some channels that that are forbidden because of because of these mesons. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So right. So so now if we do a parameter scan in the same way as before, so the couplings that we produce the the correct dark matter relic abundance. For different values of the reheating temperature, we get something that looks like this. So again, we have the warm dark matter bound at very small masses, but in particular, what we see now is that the, the smallest value of reheating temperature that, we're, that we have considered at 5 MeV, all of that is actually already excluded by uh, this Higgs to invisible uh, constraint coming from the LHC. So if the couplings were that large, we would have seen these scalars or missed seeing these scalars produced at, um, at accelerated experiments, and we haven't, so we have a bound. So essentially, you can constrain these kinds of models um, just using that, uh, uh, just using accelerated experiments. And just to locate ourselves in the parameter space of constraints, there's also plotted like uh, constraints coming from direct detection, but those are not super relevant uh, for us. Uh, so e e even kind of these large uh, couplings are not excluded by, uh, by direct detection experiments. So then, uh, yeah. So the idea is that you can you can have uh, these these models of UV freezing where you would have significantly larger couplings uh, that still being in the freezing regime, but pro probably potentially testable uh, with current and future experiments. So now what you can also, of course, do is to just get a better understanding of the parameter space. You can scan over the reheating temperature. So essentially, um, it basically tells you kind of the allowed values of couplings uh, in the entire range. So depending on what reheating temperature you choose. So in this case, you basically have uh, an exclusion bound from VBN. So we know that we cannot go much uh, smaller than 5 MeV because of VBN. And then you have these various values of couplings that give the right relic abundance for different values of dark matter masses. So if you have very large reheating temperatures, in particular, if your reheating temperature is larger than uh, half the Higgs mass, then that means that you're basically independent of, um, the abundance is basically independent of the reheating temperature. So the coupling is essentially flat there. But then as you go to smaller and smaller reheating temperatures, you, you exponentially increase the couplings that are needed to get the right relic abundance. So of course, um, now I have to do like a bit of a promotional slide. So uh, so all of this is and more has now been implemented in DocSuzy. So DocSuzy is a code that does all of these relic density calculations for you. And what we've done is essentially in the new version, just basically implemented um, all of these effects so that you can play around with it and implement your own models and it will calculate like freeze in. So, so essentially it has now freeze in routines where it can calculate the relic abundances for you taking into account all of these effects. So um, yeah, so with that, uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. So the few key takeaways, if you forget everything else, just don't forget this. So in medium and thermal effects may be relevant while calculating freeze and abundance basically depends on uh, the model that you're working with and the part of the parameter space that you're looking at. Um, most impo more importantly, uh, what we've shown is that you can incorporate all of these effects in a general formulation or reformulation of the Boltzmann equation. So you can write down the Boltzmann equation in terms of dark matter and annihilation. The added benefit of that is that if you already have a, a code that does uh, that solves this Boltzmann equation for you, it's pretty simple to kind of uh, modify that for reasons. So instead of writing writing a new Boltzmann solver from scratch, you can just reuse your old ones. Um, of course, uh, towards the end, I've talked about how Friesen models can be experimentally testable. So for, for the scope of this project, um, th uh, that wasn't really our aim to, to look at experimental signatures, but like in my other work, uh, which I'm happy to talk about, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, despite the small couplings that are present in Friesen, you can actually test them at various experiments using, using complementary research strategies. So yeah, and thanks for having me again, and I'll be happy to take questions. Um, questions? Online? So you aligned yourself with Dark Susie 
I was just like this Micromegas also has like a bunch of thermal stuff in Friesen that I, that I haven't like looked at closely, but uh, how does like, uh, how do the two compare? Are there things that, that... Uh, Very good. So uh, I've also used Micromegas in the past. So I think micro Micromegas um, Friesen routines are quite good. So they don't include uh, thermal effects. They just include like quantum statistics. So they don't include like thermal masses for particles and everything. It is possible to hack Micromega to do that, Micromegas to do that for you. I spent like several weeks doing that in the beginning of my PhD and then I swore never to do it again. And then I had to implement it in Dark Smoothie somehow. But um, anyway, uh, I think Dark Smoothie is much faster. So the Boltzmann solver in Dark Smoothie is much faster, including these effects. I think I'm, I have the, the numbers somewhere. Let me find them. Yeah, maybe it'll be more difficult to find them. But essentially, yeah, so Dark Suzy is definitely faster. But I think my, uh, just because I don't want to be too biased, uh, I think it's easier to implement models in Micromegas than it is in Dark Suzy, definitely. Shuchan, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have, uh, uh, yeah, I have one question. So here are you for the for the FF2 SS channel, right? You calculate cross section and the and you choose the tree level as the cut lower cutoff. Are there any justification for that treatment? Uh, no, the, the, the only justification for that is that we cannot, like higher order corrections cannot reduce uh, your total cross section to be smaller than the tree level one. Mm -hmm. So it can it can either be tree level or some something larger than that, but it cannot be something that is significantly mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So, so you're looking carefully at the, the Higgs portal. Like people have also looked carefully at Friesen with dark photons. Yeah. Like, a, is their state of the art similar to your state of the art, or are there differences? Um. So I don't think there is that. So, so I've done some of these temperature effects in uh, dark photons as well, and I know there's been like a lot of work done on that side, but I'm not sure if there's one that shows explicitly how. Uh, the magnitude of what these effects are. So I'm not sure that there's there's a paper that compares that like as explicitly as this. Do you want me to get all those plasmons? Like, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So they've done. Yeah. Exactly. So they've done these. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. So so I know that. Uh, so so Caitlin's also on this paper, right? So so they've done this uh, plasmon production channel, which is important. I think for low mass dark matter, this is quite important. Um, and this changes like the predictions by quite a bit because you essentially have an additional production channel. I think for larger dark matter masses, uh, I, so I, I've worked on uh, like a B minus L dark photon where you can essentially, because you're in, in medium, you uh, cancel out couplings to certain particles. So essentially, so in our model, I think we decoupled completely from like uptight quarks and that also changes the abundance. But I'm off the top of my head, I'm not sure if there's a paper that basically says, if you include these effects, this is what you get. If you exclude this, this is what you get. And like the difference is like 20%, 50%, whatever. Yeah, I, I, I still, sorry, I, I also have a question. So here, uh, uh, so here for the, uh, like the freezing line of the midi charge particle or dark photon, I generally, I think the freezing line, the coupling is around 10 to the minus. 10 to 10, 10 to minus 12, right? I mean, yeah, I haven't done the Higgs portal. So I'm just wondering why the such, you know, the coupling of the Higgs portal is freezing line is quite large comparing to, is this just because of the mass suppression of the Higgs? Um, I, I think this is just like uh, the resonance. So, yes, I'm not sure. So this, this also looks like it's 10 to the minus 12 around I, I mean, sorry. So for ex, I, I mean, I, I mean the exclusion diagram, you know, experimental. Yeah, so diagram with the uh, for UV freezing. I mean, yeah, this one. Yeah, ah, yeah. Yes. And then you know the lambda it chases always around. You know, even as large as other ones. So I'm just to yeah. only go through all this. Yeah. No, I think this is uh, this is uh, just because we are considering like small reheating temperatures, which oh, means okay. that yeah. you can you can have. You need significantly larger couplings because your production rate is suppressed by one over Higgs to the fourth. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But what about for, for freeze out? I'm sure someone has done the careful study for this. Uh, for just the scalar singlet freeze out, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah, there has been, uh, there have been updates. Uh, so I'm not, I, I don't remember this off the top of my head, but I think. 
I, I know like Jim Klein mm, had a paper, I think this was already quite some time ago. But, uh, but yeah, but I'm not sure. I think, I think usually for freeze out, people don't really worry about like all of these uh, finite temperature stuff. Mostly because uh, because you're in equilibrium, you just wash out anything that is weird <laughs> in your in your face space, basically. But sometimes, like the cross section has like a resonance as well, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, wouldn't all of these corrections be important? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I think so. So. From what we've seen, like in this particular project, like close to resonance, the for for like a Higgs model itself, like just just for Higgs model, the the effects kind of cancel out. So I wouldn't expect them to be relevant. I think also for freeze out, yeah. I don't know. I think my understanding is that for freeze out, you don't really care about these finite temperature things because you're just sensitive to like one particular temperature range, and that temperature range is usually um, not like. Uh, not high, large enough to to give you these sizable effects. Yeah, you're not optimistic. Yeah, exactly. But that's like a width, right? Like a, it's always this issue where you like you go through a resonance and then you have to figure out what the resonance is doing to your cross section. Oh, sure, resonant effects are interesting. Yeah, fine temperature effects on resonance are interesting. Yeah. If they're lined up with the freedom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, could you go go back to the, the slides of the phase transition? I mean, like the how it's how the valve changes with the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I have one very nice question here. Uh, you just, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, uh, in your picture, you know, the, the, uh, valve of the Higgs will just check the minimum y. I mean, for me, I just not really think if we if you solve its you know, equation of motion, then there seems there will be some oscillation around the minimum when when the potential goes down, right? Um, yeah. So so this description of uh, of, of the tr transition is is uh, once again very close. Yeah. to the Phase transition is not entirely accurate. Um, so so very close because so what we've done in this is kind of we've uh, ignored uh, all of these uh, some diagrams that contribute to the to to the Higgs potential. So these are these ring diagrams that have like a lot of loops and stuff. And uh, yeah, but but they don't have like a sizable effect. Oh, so sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think I may maybe I'm not very clear. So my question is, you know, if you solve the equation of motion of the Higgs and then. Uh, I just think you know when I just I think when the potential goes down, why the Higgs doesn't oscillate around its minimum, you know, because it needs to roll from the some high point to the low point, right? And then why why will we just go back and go forward and go back, you know, have some oscillation? So okay. they just check the minimum and they stay in the minimum. Yeah, because I mean this happens very uh, frequently in the ultralight scalar field, but why this doesn't happen in the electroweak phase transition. Yeah, I always see, you know, the electroweak phase transition people, they just uh, less the uh, minimum, less, less uh, valve checks the minimum. So that's mm -hmm. really why I'm quite confused. Yeah, uh, th that's a good question. I think, uh, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure about this, so don't quote me on it, but I think it might also be, uh, it might also depend on whether you consider the transition to be like first order or second order. And I, I, I think that's still like, an open question, like whether whether the Higgs actually rolls down or whether it like tunnels to the minimum. Mm -hmm. So, but it also has a width, right? So yeah, the Higgs is interacting a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, the axion is a yeah, 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 yeah. Like the axion develops a coherence, quantum coherence, because it's mm. not interacting much. Oh, so you mean you mean the decay will yeah, the decay will damp very quickly, maybe? Yeah, okay. decoheres very fast relative to the oscillation mm -hmm. factor. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I have a second question. Is you know, it's just about a little bit technical. Is when you do the fine temperature correction. I mean, because I, I think in your sub abstract, you also mentioned the uh, consideration of the Daisy diagram. I mean, I'm just wondering, is this will this make difference if you only consider the one loop calculation or you consider higher loop? Because it will it make much difference qualitatively or uh, quantitative qualitatively or just some quantitative. 
Um, I, I don't I don't think so. So so these daisy diagrams uh, in particular they're relevant like very close to the phase phase transition itself, but then they can't uh, they can't have very big like qualitative effects. So I think I think the most they will do is basically they they might change. Uh, the slope very slightly, very close to the phase transition, but like at the level of the cross section, uh, I, I I don't think that they would have like any big effects. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, and also, yeah, I generally think if the temperature goes lower than the Higgs mass or something, then they just decay exponentially. Uh, I think uh, so. So after the phase transition happens, the temperature corrections to the Higgs mass, well, they're well, okay. So, so the temperature corrections, as in the medium, the in medium temperature corrections to Higgs mass are always very small than than what the the mass of the Higgs is because of because of the potential that it is in. So, because of the web essentially. But I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I I don't think these diagrams will give you a sizable effect. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um. So let's thank Sunny again. We can continue discussing a little bit if anyone still has any further questions, but let's end the uh, seminar for, uh, for now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Anyone still has any questions?